we've heard a lot of talk today about going back to our childhood, to our younger years. I would do the opposite. I would like you to imagine yourself 10 years into the future. You're sitting inside your house, and outside on the driveway, you now have an electric car. And where you used to have a hot water system, you now have a miniature power plant, a small power unit that delivers all the electricity that you need to run your house, to charge your car. It gives you all the hot water that you need, and it heats your home at the same time. You're no longer connected to a grid. You're self-sufficient, independent. Your carbon emissions are virtually zero. Your energy bills are really, really low. And while you sit there, surrounded by the things that you value, you, you start to reflect on your life. You look back what life was like 10 years ago. How 10 years ago, electricity was supplied to you through a grid, coming from a coal-fired power plant that would waste the vast majority of the coal that went into it. 70% of all the energy contained in coal goes up in smoke. Cars were even worse. Cars had an efficiency of only 20% back then. 80% of all your fuel, unused, burned, but unused. That was bad. I'm looking back, even wonder why we accepted these kinds of efficiencies. Like, where did that come from? And why didn't we change that? But we did. And now it's different. And you're quite happy that it is. Well, unfortunately, we don't live in 2024, we live in 2014. And we are stuck with inefficient coal fired power plants. They waste the vast majority of the energy that we put into them. And the same is true for cars. And I feel that a Western society, an advanced civilization like ours, where we have cell phones, smartphones, it could do incredible things, don't have anything that's better than what we do today. Now, I can't change that. I can't change coal fire power plants, and I can't change the car industry. But I can build something that I can give to you, that I can give to the community for you to use, so you can take a little bit of control over your own energy needs. So when I talk about a miniature power plant, I'm talking about a small box. It's about the size of a washing machine. When on the one side, fuel and cold water go in, and on the other side, electricity and hot water come out. Now, the most important aspect of this kind of device is the fuel that it runs on. It's that ultimately determines how affordable and clean this technology really is. And this device has been designed to run on either methane or ethanol, that are both biofuels that we can make ourselves from biomass, from crops that we grow and process into methanol or methane or ethanol. But I want to install this today, and I don't have biofuels today, so what can we do, use instead to run this machine? Well, methane is available. All of us have a connection to natural gas, which is a fossil fuel, but it is methane. So we can use that as an intermediate source of energy to get us going for now. But methane is a gas that we can make really easily ourselves. It doesn't have to be a big company doing it for us. All you need to do is install a digester on your property. And a digester is not, nothing more than a barrel or a vessel that you fill up with organic matter, uh, grass clippings, hay, leaves, twigs, sawdust, kitchen scraps, add some water, you put a lid on, and that bacteria do the work. As bacteria break down the organic matter, they create different gases, but predominantly methane. And that methane can be fed directly into the system, and it would allow you to be independent, if you can make enough methane. Now, in all fairness, it's going to be a challenge to make enough methane to run your entire house, let alone charge your car at the same time. But it's not hard to make a contribution. Perhaps you can make 10% or 20%, 30%. And if you really want to go out there, 
you can make enough methane to power your entire house. And if you do want to make enough methane, you're looking at a digest that is about five meters across in diameter, about two meters tall. That will create all the energy that you need to power your entire house. Now, some people will have the space to do just this, and some people will have the time and energy to set it up and make it work. But maybe you don't want to be fast or you don't have the space for this. In that case, you can still rely on the methane that is supplied to you at the moment, because this device is designed to be very efficient. It will have an efficiency that is so high that even if you use fossil methane, you can still reduce your carbon emissions by up to 80%. But back to this biofuel concept, because biofuels form an important link in this chain, so to speak. There's a couple of things that I find interesting about biofuels. One aspect is that biofuels are a form of solar energy. Now, a lot of people have solar panels on the roof, which is great, and uh, other things we can do with solar uh, power. But as a massive source of solar energy, right out there, it's all the trees, all the plants that we grow. As plants grow, as a tree grows, it absorbs carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And with the help of the sun or sunlight, a process called photosynthesis allows the tree to absorb the carbon, store it inside its trunk, and release the oxygen as a waste product. But it effectively means that any plant that grows and use, uses photosynthesis is a, is a solar panel with a built-in storage facility, which is great. Because one of the problems that we have with our solar panels is that they are very efficient, but they can't store the energy, and that's a problem. So biofuels are quite important already. 50% of all the sustainable energy in Australia comes from biofuels, mostly big S, a waste product from sugarcane, compared to 12% solar, 12% hydro, uh, wind, and 25% in hydro. So biofuels already outrank solar quite substantially. Now, many companies and governments around the world have realized the potential of biofuels, and a lot of research is being done in selecting the best crops and how to increase the yield. And there are many different crops we can choose from. One of the crops that I would choose here for Australia would be giant king grass, a crop that is currently grown in China and in America and in other eight different countries, which doesn't have a particularly high energy density, but they grow really, really quickly. So we can harvest a lot of this particular crop over the course of a year, which makes it one of the most energy dense crops per hectare looking at the entire year. If we do a little bit of math, how many hectares of biofuel crops do we need to grow to power the entire nation? How many crops do we need to grow to have all our cars run on ethanol, all electricity generated from these fuels, everything? Well, we can do a quick back of an napkin calculation and see how we go. In Australia used in 2012, 3,800 petajoules of energy which equals the amount of energy contained in 3 million hectares of giant king grass. But it assumes that all the energy contained in giant king grass can be converted into useful energy, which is unlikely. So let's assume that we're going to waste 40% of the energy and only 60% of the energy contained in this crop is useful. That means we need 5 million hectares of giant king grass. But at 5 million hectares, covers all our energy needs. So that assumes we don't have solar power, we don't have wind, we don't have hydro, we don't make methane in our back garden, we don't digest our sewage, which we do, we don't collect green waste, which we do. So that number, in reality, is a lot lower than what it was, than was shown here. But how much is 5 million hectares? Because that's a big number. That's a lot of land. Now, 5 million hectares is a patch of land that measures 220 by 220 k's. And all of a sudden, that sounds not that outrageous. Like, oh, that's doable. And if we compare that to the amount of crops that we are growing at the moment, it becomes a lot more feasible again. 13.5 million hectares, grain alone in Australia. A 30 million hectares of cropland. One of the arguments that is sometimes raised against biofuels is that we need to sacrifice 
valuable crop land, or we don't, because giant king grass doesn't like valuable crop land. It likes poor soil. It grows well in very warm, humid climates. It grows really well up north in Australia. So we can even increase our crop land by another 5 million hectares. The last interesting aspect that I want to highlight here about biofuels is that all plants that use photosynthesis, that absorb carbon dioxide, are carbon sinks or carbon traps. They trap carbon inside their material. And what's interesting about this is that we have a massive carbon trap. If we're going to grow biofuels on this kind of scale, we have an enormous trap to hold or retain carbon for a certain period of time. So the crop is growing, absorbing carbon dioxide, retaining the carbon inside this crop, and then we harvest it, but the carbon is still inside the crop. It's still there. It's not gone back into the atmosphere. And then we process it, which takes another day, and the carbon is still there. Now it's in the fuel and in some waste products, but it's still there. And then we finally transport it and burn it, and this is where the carbon is released again. But in these, these couple of days, each day retains a certain amount of carbon. So as, as long as we don't burn all the fuels that we made, we still have that carbon trapped. And we'll always have that. If we use biofuels as a source of energy, we'll always have a certain amount of biofuels that are in the process, in the chain. And it gives us a choice. All of a sudden, we have a choice in how much carbon dioxide we want to absorb. So 5 million hectares of giant king grass absorbs 300 megatons of carbon dioxide in a year which doesn't mean anything because it's released again when we burn it. But it does mean that we are trapping nearly a megaton of carbon dioxide each day. So if we burn it, we're releasing that again. But before we do that, we store it. So there's an opportunity here to regulate the atmospheric carbon dioxide levels. If we force or choose to keep it in storage for four or five days, we are trapping up to four million megatons, uh, four megatons of carbon dioxide for that period of time. So by extending, by extending the amount of time that we keep in the storage, we can lower the carbon dioxide levels. Back to this machine. So a fuel goes in and electricity comes out, and some sort of magic happens on the inside that converts electricity, uh, a fuel into electricity. This animation shows the core of the machine. This is the heart. This is where it all uh, comes together. We have three choices when we're looking at converting uh, energy or getting energy from methane or a biofuel. The first one is to use steam, steam generation, and use steam turbine. But steam turbines are only efficient on a very large scale, so they wouldn't work here. The second option is to use fuel cells, which are extremely efficient. They work really, really well but they're quite expensive, and they don't live very long. You're going to have to replace them every two years. And the third option is a combustion engine. And what you're looking at here is an animation of a new type of combustion engine. But combustion engines have one downside, pretty much one, and that is that they are very inefficient. A petrol engine has an efficiency of 25%. A diesel engine has an efficiency of 40%, which is a lot better than petrol. Still, it's not good enough. But there is a little trick there. Why is diesel so much more efficient than petrol? That is all to do with the amount of compression that we can allow. A diesel, diesel gas can be compressed much more than petrol. And there's different reasons why that is. In any case, both methane and ethanol allow the same kind of compression, and even more than diesel does. So it's a, it's a good fuel from that perspective. The reason that all engines still have a terrible efficiency is because of the design. The piston traveling down after a combustion reaches the end of a cycle and it can't go down any further. But there's still a lot of energy left inside the chamber that can't come out. The piston is about to go back up again, so now we have to open the exhaust port and let 36% of all the energy that is released escape through the exhaust pipe. Now this animation, this design, uses the full cycle of the combustion. So the piston, after combustion, the piston travels downwards, using up the energy released in the combustion. But at some point, it's going to reach a point in its cycle 
but there's no more energy left inside the chamber. So the pressure inside is now equal to the pressure outside. But the piston travels down even further and now creates a vacuum. And that vacuum forces the valve at the top to open and allow a new mixture in. And then it travels down further again until it reaches the bottom of its cycle where the exhaust port opens. Then the piston travels back up again, pushing all the exhaust fumes, all the fumes from the previous combustion out the exhaust ports, going past these two exhaust ports, compressing the new mixture, and the whole cycle starts over. Now the reason that I'm explaining this to you is not so much for you to understand how this works. The reason that I'm explaining this is because that anything that's in the public domain cannot be patented. And now that I've explained this to you, it's in the public domain. Nobody can patent this concept. Nobody can buy the concept. Nobody can give me money. This is now up for grabs. And that's my point. I want to make a change. I want things to be different. And I want anyone in any town to be able to use this. And this is where it all comes together for me. I started this talk with a vision, an image, what life could be like 10 years into the future, where you can have reduced carbon emissions, where you have a choice, where you can reduce energy bills, where you can be energy independent. If that is something that you want, if that is something that you aspire to or are inspired by, what you can do is share this. Talk about it. What we need to make a change is nothing short of an energy revolution. We can wait for government to take action. Maybe bet on an emission trading scheme or a carbon tax. I don't see change happening anytime soon. If anything is going to change, it's because of us. So we have a choice here. We can, ch we can choose to sit back and hope for politicians to take action, wait for researchers to come up with a solution, or we do it ourselves. So I invite, now I challenge, if there's any engineers in this audience here, to look at this and show me, tell me what I've missed. I'm not perfect. There are mistakes in this reasoning. But don't just shoot it down, come with a solution. And I'm not just looking for engineers, environmental scientists. We need to tackle biofuels, farmers growing it. I need a whole host of people. So we need to spread the word. So go online, talk to your friends, take it to work, anywhere you go. And together, we can make a change. And I can only conclude this in one way. Thank <laughs> you.